Let's see. Record. Very good. Now I need to get back to my session. Very good. All right. We have another participant here. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, I'm uh, doing a Zoom session. I, I'm going to sit here and uh, screen is available for you. Uh, but uh, I'm going to record the session and share with the other class members. So you benefit and uh, those do, others also will benefit. And uh, you can also go back to the video and uh, take a look at it. So uh, the class will be just as normal, uh, except that I won't walk around because I will have to be in front of keyboard and screen to advance my uh, slides. You folks who are not here, uh, to just refresh your memory, we started the chapter on civil liberties. We talked about uh, Bill of Rights last time. Initially, the Bill of Rights were not incorporated to the Constitution. Gradually, through different cases, we discussed uh, several of those. The provisions of the Bill of Rights were uh, incorporated Constitution. So we discussed those. You may get the notes from Haley. Haley has the notes. And we talk, we started talking about the First Amendment. Let me just uh, refer uh, to uh, First Amendment here, that uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, prohibiting free exercise of, then uh, free speech, free press, um, peaceable assemble and petition the government. So we are going to cover these in this chapter. We started with the religion. And speaking of religion, um, I covered um, a few cases about the wall of separation. And uh, we discussed um, the case uh, of uh, Everson versus Board of Education, Engel versus uh, Vitell about the you know uh, uh, wall of separation. Then we talked about uh, Wallace versus Jeffrey, Abington versus school districts, uh, Abington school district versus Shemp, Reynolds versus United States, and then we discussed about creation and uh, evolution and the cases related to that. We watched the video, short video. And today we are going to start with this, again, wall of separation, this case. Uh, assistance to church-related um, schools. This involves the case of, so today's lecture is about freedom of religion. Uh, we are continuing it with the case of uh, Lemon versus uh, Kurtzman, 1971. Uh, prior, not the prior, I'm sorry. In this case would allow to fund the salaries of teachers in parochial proc uh, schools. And the court did not allow such funding. Government cannot give money to religious schools to uh, fund salaries of the teachers in religious schools according to the Supreme Court in this case. It established three standards. 
let's discuss these uh, standards. First, uh, the question was, uh, did the Rhode Island and Pennsylvania statute law violate the First Amendment establishment clause, making state financial aid available to church-related educational institutions? That was the question for the court. And uh, the court established what is called the lemon test, lemon test or standard. There are three uh, tests. First, the law must have secular purpose. The law must have secular purpose. Second, its primary effect must be not to advance or inhibit religion. The third criteria, it must not entangle the government excessively with religion. So these are called lemon standard criteria tests, according to this case. So uh, this uh, became a really important case for the future cases uh, about textbook, about speech and hearing problem diagnostic services, standardized tests, and many other related issues in uh, religious schools and uh, using uh, tax money. All right, uh, since you are not taking the notes, uh, I'm just going to advance a little bit faster. So uh, that was uh, basically uh, important case and we will refer to uh, some others later on uh, uh, when the case comes up. So uh, freedom of religion also involves a display of nativity seen in a courthouse or in public places. This case was uh, in 1984, Lynch versus Donnelly. And the question was, there was a display uh, in a courthouse, public place. Did having a nativity scene in the city's Christmas display violate the establishment clause, wall of separation? The court ruled that this kind of a display religious artifact was acceptable. It doesn't have a religious purpose. How many people are going to go look at the nativity scene, say that, oh, I'm Christian. Or if there is a scene about religious display, Muslims, uh, Jews, Buddha, or oh, I'm converted to this uh, religion because of this uh, display. So uh, the court said it's okay, uh, we can do that. But it gets complicated. The next case, uh, Vaughn Ordon versus Prey, in 2005. So uh, you can see uh, that uh, different cases comes up, different issues. Uh, this was in uh, Texas, in the grounds of state capitol building. And uh, the court uh, tried to, you know, uh, again, depending on the who's in the court, whether you have a liberal conservative judges, the decisions can swing back and forth. So uh, court ruled that establishment clause did not bar monument on the grounds of Texas State Capitol building. So uh, it's okay to display it in a Capitol building. Uh, so uh, not a problem. Uh, if you just the background to know what the story was, I thought to include this uh, things that on the ground of Texas Capitol building, there was a, you know, 10th commandment um, display. And uh, Thomas Vaughn Orden believed that this 
prompted uh, you know, uh, the violation of the First Amendment. So uh, the court uh, ruled that um, it's okay. Uh, this doesn't uh, uh, violate the First Amendment. Now, uh, those two cases supported the display. Is it okay? But check out this case. McCreary County versus ACLU. Similar case uh, in Kentucky. The court had a opposite results. Again, look at the vote, four to five swing votes. So uh, there was a display, uh, ACLU challenged it. The court um, said the, the First Amendment requires the government to be neutral about religion. And putting the Tenth Amendment on the government property violates the principle. You see, this case is the exact what happened in the uh, Texas uh, case. Uh, Mon case, Orden case. So installing them in the courthouse is especially disturbing because it sends a message that the legal system will favor one religion to another. So they said uh, you are not supposed to have the 10th commandment on the courthouse. So you can see that the court, uh, depending on the composition, goes back and forth on certain decisions. Saluting the flag. A group of uh, Jahua witnesses challenged the law requiring the saluting the flag in 1914. Mineralsville versus Cobitus. Cobitus. The court ruled that your religious belief does not relieve the citizens from their political responsibilities. You must salute the flag. Look at the decision, 8 to 1. And uh, students uh, refused to do it. The decision, the court argued that the national unity is the basis of uh, national security. That was, you know, uh, before the Second World War. And the authorities have the right to select appropriate means for uh, its uh, achievement, attainment. So you must salute the flag. Decision sense reaches the conclusions that compulsory measures toward the national unity or constitution. 1940, again, Next case, the court says, okay, no, you don't have to. West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett 43, the court reversed itself, said no. No one could be compelled by government to declare any belief. So, the court overturned the Gobitas ruling. The majority opinion cited the individual's right to religious freedom and rights to free speech protected by the First Amendment, as well as the right equal protection of the laws and guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. So the court invalidated the flag saluting law in public schools and established the students uh, possesses some level of, uh, you know, the first amendment rights. Just, uh, I mentioned this last time, uh, to the students for here, uh, to you too, since Angel and um, uh, you were not here. Uh, 
I have too much information on these slides to just give you background information uh, to know what the case was. Certain cases are very clear. So uh, there is no need to go to the details, but certain others you need to know. This is just for your info, but you need to know the case and the decision. What happened in, you know, Gobitis? What happened in uh, Everson versus Board of Education? And the decision, not uh, how many vote, you know, which, which how many Supreme Court decisions, stuff like that. No, I will not ask questions uh, of that nature. Uh, another case that was probably you may remember, you may not remember, uh, 2014, this is a recent case, again, too much information on these slides just to, to make the case familiar to you. We don't need to uh, remember for test purpose. But uh, the story was uh, under the Patient Protection and Affordable uh, Care Act, ACA, companies were required uh, to provide you know, health insurance for uh, employees. Under that uh, health insurance, contraceptives were also included. Hobby Lobby, arts and crafts chain with over 13,000 employees, big one, refused, said, no, we don't want it. It's cor corporations, the religious beliefs, uh, the religious, uh, or the owner was a religious person said, no, I don't want to pay for the employee's uh, contraceptive um, devices under this law. This is unconstitutional. So uh, the question was, do for-profit employers, corporations, have to pay for insurance that covers contraceptions? Do you know the answer? Yes or no? The court, uh, it's just extra information. You don't need to worry about it. I explained what the case was. Let's go to the next slide. The court said no. Uh, again, four to five decision. The ruling was reached citing that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, because mandate was not the least uh, restrictive method of implementing with government's interest. So the court said that corporations controlled by religious families cannot be required to pay for the contraceptions of coverage for their female workers. That's not right at all. Because I mean, the hormone, the hormone medicine that I take uh, technically counts as birth control. That, that means if I were to work for Hobby Lobby, I would be able, I would just be in pain all the time because of that. Yeah, I think in this case, Angel, I don't know for sure, it was like certain types of contraceptives, not everything. Yeah, but uh, like birth control is also for hormone control for like people like me. For like, for instance, if I weren't on it, I'd be screaming in pain on the floor right now. And but the medicine I take is birth control, and it helps because whatever it does to my body which makes me temporarily infertile, helps with that pain. And many women take it for the same reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether it's right or wrong, that was the court decision. I see your point, very valid point. I know some uh, woman uh, takes that for hormonal balance, certain uh, you know pills and stuff to balance their hormones. But I think, as I said, uh, from what I, remember reading is about devices more so than the pills. So that's a little bit gets complicated. The impact for this also for vaccination. What about your religion says 
don't vaccinate, blood transfusion, stem cell tra treatment. So it has implications for other areas as well too. So some court cases may come up and so you can see that uh, uh, how the court swings. Remember again, uh, folks, uh, the combination composition of the court is very important on these decisions. That's the reason the big fight goes on always between conservatives and liberals. If it is a liberal court, um, it will go. It will go to one direction. If it is conservative, to another direction. So it may reverse in two years, one year. If we have a you know a democratic presidents winning and changing the composition of the court, it may reverse that decision. So it's not permanent. This is also interesting. I thought to uh, uh, share with you that uh, again, uh, a wall of separation. Masterpiece uh, Cakes Shop versus Colorado. Let's see what the case was. Uh, gay couples um, go to a cake shop and uh, to make a, you know, a cake for them. And the owner says, I cannot make the same sex wedding cake because that goes against my religion. I'm protected by the first uh, amendment. My cakes are artistic expression, exactly what the first amendment protects. It's a creation, my artwork. To protect the rights of LGBT uh, gay people, uh, there was a law, Colorado law, that uh, said cake shop cannot discriminate against us for being gay. Colorado law requires that the cake shop to sell us custom cakes, just like the shop sells cakes to others. They're products, they can refuse. See, remember here, it's very tricky. Gays look at as a product, the owner looks at the artwork. So it depends on court, what is try, trying to look at in this picture here, the case. Are you going to look at the product, production as a commodity or the artistic work of the owner? Let's see what happened in the case. I told you the Colorado law said it required the equal treatment of the sales of the goods, services to anybody without a sex, the orientation, sexual orientation. The court protected the owner of the shop under the artistic work. Remember, I told the artistic work is very important. So the court ruled that the Colorado agency or law was hostile toward religion when it ruled against a cake shop because it went to the state court and state court ruled in favor of gays. Then the shop appealed to the Supreme Court. That's what the case was. And the Colorado agency will have to reconsider the case without hostility toward the cake shop owners religious argument so the court didn't say this is a product we don't care that what the you know the cake is but the work that the guy is doing is an artistic work so you can't force the artists to do something against his religion so uh, they did not um, discuss that you know selling or not selling is constitutional or uh, legal or illegal but uh, the work as such uh, is protected under the First Amendment. So uh, protection of First Amendment, strong. And the court ruled that commission, um, whatever, you know, the state agency, 
did not employ religious neutrality, violating uh, masterpiece owners, Jack Phillips, rights to free exercise of First Amendment. And uh, so reverse the commission's uh, decision that the state level. Now, this case I included for you, uh, it will not be in the test. This is just uh, two days ago. I read on the news that uh, Supreme Court is going to look at another case. Uh, there is a person, lady, uh, is a web designer uh, who is refusing to provide service for the same-sex um, couple. And she's going to put something on the, her website that she is not going to uh, serve, uh, wouldn't serve, offer any services for the same-sex people gay people. So it is right now uh, is uh, being discussed in the court. So it's going to be interesting to see what will happen. I just thought these are current events I thought to share. With you. Any questions, comments? No? Okay. Let's move on. Conclusion about the freedom of religion. There are many other cases. We, our time does not allow me to uh, cover these. Uh, we highlighted the important ones, the ones that the book covers. Uh, freedom of religion is and has been deeply a divisive issue in the court, depending on the composition of the court. Court has tried to weigh the rights of individual against the needs of the society to determine whether a law violates the freedom of religion and uh, lemon test is a good guide in general, but uh, again, the composition changes this. I'm repeating the, because this is going to be in the test uh, in several questions, uh, lemon versus Kurtzman, that uh, the law has to have a secular purpose rather than religious, whatever the law is. Does the law uh, neither promotes nor encourages religion? Does the law avoid the excessive entang entanglement of the government with religious uh, institutions? So this is the general guideline, but it gets tricky about um, some other details. And uh, so uh, that's basically uh, what you need to know for uh, freedom of religion under the first amendment of the constitution. Uh, let's discuss, uh, that was the wall of separation. Now, let's discuss the uh, next clause of the First Amendment about uh, religious freedom. Belief and practice are two different things. You can believe what you want to, but you can't always practice it. So we want to talk about uh, uh, free exercise clause. It's called free exercise of religion. Can you believe in any religion and exercise? Are you free under the First Amendment? The answer is no. Freedom to believe is not the same thing to freedom to act. When secular and religious law comes into conflict, the right to excessive to exercise one's religious belief is often denied. So you believe should not belief and practice should not contradict with civil laws to disturb the order in the society. Freedom of religion is protected as means of ensuring religious tolerance in the United States. But not all the religious practices are accepted or acceptable. Example, polygamy, snake handling, illegal drugs. Like uh, there was a case, Indians, um, Native Americans used drugs for healing stuff. Uh, the court said no. Oh, you can't do that. Polygamy, polygamy, we discussed last time. You were not uh, 
here in the class. Poly means many, gummy means what? Marriage, yeah. So uh, bigamy, polygamy, bigamy means more than one wife. Polygamy means having uh, several uh, wives um, as uh, spouses. So uh, like a Mormon or Muslim religion, these are practiced, allowed, but not, or allowed according to the civil laws. So uh, you can't practice what you uh, believe always in the uh, United States. We talked about Mormon church. So uh, poison, um, snake handling, uh, there were Supreme Court cases, uh, drugs, the case of uh, Bond versus North Carolina, Oregon versus Smith, uh, medical treatment, sick child, you know, a uh, few religions says no medications and then government says you have to protect ch children. So you have to do it. So uh, human sacrifice, these are some of the examples of free exercise that you can believe whatever you want to, but you can't, you may not practice if it is in conflict with um, civil laws. So we finished uh, freedom of religion. Let's talk about freedom of speech. This is a quotation from me. Freedom of speech is the right from which all other freedoms uh, initiate, flow. From my perspective, it's extremely important to make democracy meaningful because without this freedom of speech, other freedoms are meaningless. In the United States, they did a survey, asked people uh, about First Amendment. Many people don't know other freedoms, but they all, majority, 56%, refer to uh, freedom of speech. People are aware that uh, freedom of speech is mentioned in the First Amendment is very important, more so than others. So I just want to show you this graphic that uh, freedom of speech in democratic system for Americans are very important. Democracy is meaningless without freedom of speech. Speaking your opinion uncontrolled by censorship or other restrictions. That's the freedom of speech is one of your natural rights as a human being to be able to speak freely. Elections, separation of powers, campaign, freedom of religion, are meaningless without freedom of speech. If you don't have a freedom of speech, freedom of religion doesn't mean anything. Election doesn't mean anything. So you must have freedom of speech to protect your uh, democratic values. So this is going to be what? Involve a lot of court cases. So, uh, before I go to the court cases, campaign, just example, one example, gets to the money issue. We will talk about this later on the chapter related to campaign. So uh, why does this corporation, that corporations give money to this candidate, that candidate? It's protected under free speech. To give money to whomever you want is in this country, you can do that. So that's the reason big corporations give money to the candidates protected under First Amendment. Before we go to the Supreme Court cases, let's talk about congressional limits on free speech. Congress imposed several, passed several laws to put limits on freedom of speech 
right after the US government was established at the beginning, 1798, Congress passed Sedition Act of 1798, says that stirring up rebellion against government is uh, not allowed, false outlaw, false scandalous or malicious speech or writing against national government. The president or Congress with the intent to defame or bring into contempt or disrupt. These are not allowed under this law, Sedition Act of 1798. Then in 1940, before the war, Second World War, Smith Act of 1940 made it a crime to teach or advocate violent overthrow of the government. You can't do that. Then we are going to discuss some court cases. 1950, McCarran Act of 1950 requires registration of Communist Party members and organizations. After Second World War, there was a fear of communism. So uh, this uh, law was passed to um, uh, kind of uh, check on the communist parties and organizations. Another law passed by Congress, Anti-Riot Bill of 1968, makes it a crime to cross state lines and incite riots or conspire to do so. So you see your right to freedom of speech, your right to uh, uh, freedom of religion has limits. You cannot, certain things uh, cannot be done or said. We have some limitations. It's not the absolute freedom. One cannot yell fire in crowded movie, public places to cause an airplane or something like that or airport, cause chaos. Anti-communist movement, I told you that uh, government imposed some limitations. We are going to discuss after the first world war, 1919, Schenck versus US. I'm going to discuss this case in detail. Clear and present danger. If your speech represents clear and present danger can be forbidden by government, or it has bad tendency, it, it may be forbidden. Gitlow versus New York. We will discuss that. Fighting words, hate speech. Commercial speech, the court have upheld the federal truth in advertising laws and FCC advertising restrictions on cigarette and alcohol. I don't know if you have noticed, uh, TV stations, radios cannot run ads on cigarette and alcohol. So in the United States, there are some limits on that. Libel and sl slander are not protected. Uh, libel represents printed attack against another person. Slander is a spoken attack. That's the difference to defame a person. Angel, what time do you have? You keep the time because I don't see the time. Seven fifty-seven. Seven? Fifty-seven. Six fifty-seven. Okay. You just let me know uh, about the time uh, because I'm not seeing the time, so. Uh, 8.20 is when we leave, right? 8.15, we wrap it up, yeah. You just let me know, yeah. Huh? Uh, raise your hand or say something. All right. Um, we give five minutes for questions in case you have one, because these are so important uh, cases. Obscenity, a very tricky one. I will have a case, um, we will discuss those and uh, see what the Supreme Court uh, says about obscenity. Let's see what the Supreme Court uh, 
criteria is for free speech. The court standards are somewhat contradictory. Sometimes it says protected, sometimes it's, no, it's not protected. Before the war, after the war, during the war, the insensitive times, it lets certain things go with certain times, certain other times uh, tries to restrict it. So it um, goes back and forth. So we will see in this uh, different cases. It is sometimes unclear which one the court will use in particular cases. Uh, gets tricky. Clear and present danger test. This is, involves the case of Schenck versus US after the First World War, 1919. The court established clear and present um, danger test based on this case. What was the case? He was a member or secretary uh, of uh, Socialist Party. Socialist means communism. He sent, uh, that's the economic system. We discussed this in uh, uh, first test, before first test. He sent out uh, 15,000 leaflets to men who had been called to military service, urging them to oppose the war and serve in military. He was indicted, convicted for espionage under Espionage Act of 1970. The case goes to Supreme Court. Here is the question. Does the statute that Espionage Act of 1970 in question violates freedom of speech, press guaranteed by the First Amendment? Let's see what the Supreme Court says. No, it does not violate. Of course, it was in New York. Was New York's law of punishing anarchy, which uh, with the implications of focus on overthrowing the government, violate free speech under the First Amendment? That's a question, in putting it in a different way. And the court ruled that under the normal circumstance to obstruct the draft would have been protected by First Amendment. Remember, I put the date, date is important, after the war, so sensitive. But the character of every act must be judged according to the circumstance in which it was done. Condition, after the war, you know, the fear was there, millions of people dead in Europe uh, or Americans. Many things that may be of no consequences in times of peace, but may not be said when a nation is at war. So uh, it is not protected by the First Amendment, uh, whatever the Schenck did. That was, you know, distribute leaflets to uh, not to uh, serve in the draft. Uh, Let's see if we can uh, see this. We have the time. I think we are going so with a full speed. Let's see if we can see this short video here. Why is it doing this? I want to go to the link. Just how far does an individual's right to free speech extend? The 1919 court case of Shank versus the United States was central in defining some of the limitations of free speech rights. You see, during World War I, the U.S. instituted a military draft in which 24 million men registered and 2.5 million were actually drafted into the military. This generated outrage from certain anti-war groups such as socialists, anarchists, and peace advocates. Now, President Woodrow Wilson was not a fan of the demonstrations or anti-war literature that some of these groups were generating. Wilson said, such creatures of passion, disloyalty, and anarchy must be crushed out. One such protester was Charles Schenck. He was a member of the Socialist Party and was responsible for distributing a leaflet urging recently drafted men to resist the draft. 
This pamphlet asserted that the draft violated the 13th Amendment, which prohibited involuntary servitude or slavery. He also condemned the federal government and the war. The federal government then arrested Schenck and charged him with violating the Espionage Act of 1917, which made it a crime to obstruct the recruiting or enlistment service. Schenck maintained that the First Amendment's free speech clause protected his right to criticize the government. The Supreme Court took up the question. Unfortunately for Charles Schenck, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously against him. They argued that wartime circumstances changed the rules related to the right of free speech. The court, in an opinion written by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. said, we admit that in many places and in ordinary times, the defendants in saying all that was said in the circular would have been within their constitutional rights. But the character of every act depends on the circumstances in which it is done. The court also created the clear and present danger rule, a new test for free speech. The court decided the question in every case is whether the words used are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. When a nation is at war, many things that might be said in time of peace are such a hindrance to its effort that their utterance will not be endured so long as men fight and that no court could regard them as protected by any constitutional right. From saying bomb on an airplane to yelling fire in a crowded theater, Shank versus the United States is still applicable today. Clear and present danger would guide free speech conversations until the 1969 case of Brandenburg versus Ohio clarified it further, bringing us imminent lawless action. This would define suppressed speech as speech that incites the imminent and likely violation of a law. But that's a story for another time. For more information on this and many other important court cases throughout history, be sure to check out the other videos in our homework help series. Please don't hesitate to hit the like button below and make sure to subscribe for future homework help videos. I like that video because uh, short, sweet, to the point, and there are several test questions. So I thought to uh, repeat the stuff that I already covered and um, make sure that you don't miss those questions and you understand the case very well. So, uh, we already covered all these, so let me move on. Um, uh, it had, you know, uh, evil effect. Uh, uh, therefore, um, the court sided with the state law. The second criteria is bad tendency. Uh, this is originated from the Gitlow versus New York case. This case also is very important because I have already covered this, but I repeat one more time. Uh, you were not here uh, last time. So uh, this guy was the member of uh, socialist uh, movement. And uh, he published uh, leaflets printed some materials calling the citizens to join together, overthrow the United States bourgeois government. Bourgeois means capitalist, is a French word. The Supreme Court ruled that Gitlow could be punished for his statements. Why? Because it has a bad tendency. People may not overthrow the government right away, but something like this, it may happen in the future. The court argued that one cannot expect the government to wait until it will, you know, last minute after it was overthrown to punish the person. So when a speech have a bad tendency, it can be banned under the Gitlow versus New York case, bad tendency. So the first criteria was clear and present danger, evil effect. Then uh, this one is bad tendency. Now look at this one. This negates the first two preferred positions. The court in some other cases to preserve, argued that to preserve democracy, freedom of speech, 
press must be given special attention, must be protected. Many justices of the Supreme Court have argued that free speech deserves stronger protection than other freedoms. They believe that freedom of speech should have special and preferred positions in the American political system. So three criteria, just depending on how the court is going to react depends on the circumstance. So uh, also you need to know that the First Amendment prohibits imposition of prior restraints on publication or speech before it was made. The person defamed is left to his remedy in libel cases. If you speak uh, dangerous words, is a slander, written is libel. So nobody can censor my speech before I come to the class or any teacher, but we are liable that if we say something untrue about somebody, uh, that person may uh, sue us or anybody, any place, any anything. So, but it's not so easy. It's very complicated uh, when it comes to these kind of cases. Uh, not simple like that. Let's discuss Brandenburg versus Ohio, 1969. Clarence Brandenburg was the leader of uh, uh, Ohio KKK. You know what the KK stands for. K, Klex, Klon, Klan, Klan, yeah. Made threatening speech against government officials. He had been convicted under the state law for his remarks. The court reversed his conviction declared that threatening speech is protected by the First Amendment. Preferred position, remember? Unless the government can prove that such advocacy is directed to inflicting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to produce such action. So it's okay to make threatening speech. <laughs> Not so easy again, very tricky. Brandenburg versus Ohio. Lewd, obscene, libelous, profanity, fighting words are not protected under the First Amendment. Let's look at the case of Chaplinesky versus New Hampshire, 1942. A Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses, witness was convicted under the state statute for calling city marshal, goddamn racketeer and demanded uh, damned fascist in a public place. He got arrested, convicted the stat uh, and the Supreme Court upheld Chaplinsky's conviction on the theory that fighting words that inflict injury or in, tend to incite an immediate breach of the peace do not convey ideas, thus are not subject to the First Amendment protection. The court just goes back and forth. You saw in the previous case, it said, okay, KKK member, made threatening speech is preferred position, but not in this case. Again, this is during the war, 1942. The fighting words are not protected. What that fighting words are, in what circumstance? A million dollar question. Okay, let's talk about symbolic speech. Not all speeches are verbal. Gesture, your middle finger, movements, 
articles of clothing, your hair color, your pants that you wear on the public, you know, um, some guys uh, drop their uh, pants. Uh, those are symbolic speech. We are trying to convey a message. We are trying to say something. It's called symbolic speech. Are they protected? Can you, you know, the guys can drop their pants uh, to halfway, uh, walk around the public places. There were, were some Supreme Court cases on that. Or can you just display your middle finger in the public places to someone, something to, uh, you know, uh, get away from it? You are not saying anything, but that gesture, you know, conveys some ideas. Let's discuss uh, Tinker versus uh, Des Moines Independent County School District, 1969. Three students who wore black armband to protect the Vietnam War. They were suspended because they were wearing black arm to protest the war. Uh, challenge in the court, state court went to the, all the way to Supreme Court. Supreme Court overturned their suspension. Just wearing armbands, okay, that symbolic speech is protected. It's not going to harm anyone. Next case, two years later, Cohen versus California, 1971. Paul Cohen wore a jacket which uh, had uh, F words to the draft. He was arrested, uh, convicted, uh, went through the legal process and appealed the Supreme Court, reversed his conviction. interesting right because court just goes back and forth somebody wears a t-shirt jacket with f words uh, the court said um, it's okay you can do that another symbolic speech is burning what U.S. flag as a symbolic speech. Here I have a question for you to see if you can, uh, if you know the case. Anyone knows the case here? I don't know the case, but I do know that flag code, you're actually supposed to burn it if the flag is too tattered and worn, if it's no longer, if it, if it looks, if, if the flag is more, more in tattered and no longer like you're supposed to burn it because that's the most respectful way to use your flag. Which one of these are correct? So I have no clue what the case was. <laughs> Any wild guess? <clears throat> A, final answer. A is not the correct answer. I'm going to go with maybe D. D, D is correct. Yeah, Angel is right. D is correct answer. And we will discuss this. D is a correct answer. Yes, in the United States, Angel, you can burn the US flag as a symbolic speech. It is not against the law. So let's discuss these uh, cases. There are two cases that we will discuss. Texas versus uh, uh, Johnson, 1988. The court ruled that flag burning is protected by the First Amendment. I will discuss the case in detail uh, in the next few slides. But it's, it's 817 right now. 817? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me just stop on flag burning. So we get to this topic uh, next time. I'm going to stop here. Uh, and uh, time flies when you have a good time. Uh,
let's see Zoom meeting. Um, we need to stop. You can uh, leave if you want to. Class is adjourned. I need to just make sure that I can process this correctly. So we stopped on uh, flag burning. Flag burning. All right. Have a wonderful day. Uh, and stop sharing. Stop share. I did. Now my recording. Uh, stop. We need to stop the recording.